All right, today we are diving deep into two of the most critical documents in all of medicine, the brand new 2025 guidelines for newborn resuscitation. We're gonna put the European and American playbooks right next to each other and see how the world's experts are planning for one of life's most precious and fragile moments. But first, let me ask you a question. What's the single most important breath you will ever take? I mean, really think about it. The answer, of course, is your very first one. That one incredible moment where your lungs, which have been filled with fluid for nine months, have to make the instantaneous switch to breathing air. It's a wild thought, right? Now, for a newborn who's in trouble, that transition doesn't always go so smoothly. And that is where these two rule books come in. On one side of the Atlantic, you've got the European Resuscitation Council, or the ERC. And on the other, you have the American Heart Association and the American Academy of Pediatrics, the AHA and AAP. Both of them just dropped their updated 2025 guidelines, so let's get into it. So you'd think these two manuals would be basically carbon copies, wouldn't you? I mean, the mission is the same, save the baby. But here's where it gets really interesting. They actually start from slightly different philosophical places. Okay, this slide right here gets to the very heart of it. The AHA thinks about the entire journey. They call it the newborn chain of care, this big seven-step process from way before birth all the way to post-resuscitation care. It's a holistic, big-picture view. The ERC, on the other hand, is like a laser beam. They are zeroed in on that one single event, the unique physiological transition. For them, job one, two, and three is getting air into those lungs. Everything else is secondary to that one critical goal. And not difference in philosophy? It's not just academic, it actually ripples out and affects everything that comes next, starting with how a team prepares before the baby is even born. So both sides agree on the basics. High-risk birth, you need a bigger, more skilled team. Makes sense. But the AHA lays down a hard and fast rule. At every single birth, there must be at least one person whose only responsibility is the newborn. That's their sole focus. The ERC is a little more general, suggesting a team that's proportionate to the expected risk. It's a subtle difference, but it says a lot about their approach to setting minimum standards. And we see that same kind of pattern again, with something as simple as the temperature in the delivery room. The AHA keeps it simple. Just make sure it's at least 23 degrees Celsius, period. The ERC, though, gets a bit more granular. They want it a little warmer for term babies, and even warmer, over 25 degrees, for the most premature infants. Again, a small detail that reveals a slightly different way of thinking. All right, let's get into the action. The baby's here. The clock is ticking. We are in that first absolutely crucial minute of life. And this, this is where we see the two paths really start to diverge in a big way. But before we get into the debate, let's start where there is total, complete harmony. For a healthy baby who's crying and doing well, both manuals say the exact same thing. Wait. Wait at least 60 seconds before you clamp that umbilical cord. That little pause allows a massive, beneficial blood transfusion from the placenta to the baby. It's a huge deal. Okay, but what if the baby is not vigorous and needs help right now? Well, that's where this technique called cord milking comes in. And you guessed it, they have very different takes on it. The AHA sees it as a reasonable option, a proactive choice you can make. But the ERC, they're way more cautious. For them, it's a last resort, something you only consider if delaying the clamp is physically impossible. You can really feel that difference in risk assessment. And now we come to the main event, the absolute cornerstone of newborn resuscitation, helping that baby take its first breaths. And folks, this is where the differences are not just subtle, they are significant. Before you can act, you've got to assess. You need to know what you're dealing with. Both agree you start by listening to the heart, but the HA really, really emphasizes getting an ECG on that baby as quickly as possible. Why? Because it's fast. It's super accurate. And when things get chaotic and you have to start compressions, it is the most reliable way to know the baby's true heart rate. And here we go. This slide shows what might be the single biggest practical difference between them. Think about blowing up a brand new balloon. You don't just give it a quick puff, right? You give it a long, slow, steady breath to get it started. That is exactly the ERC's logic. They say to start with five initial long, slow breaths to gently open up those fluid-filled lungs. The AHA, by contrast, says just start with standard ventilations right from the beginning. It's two completely different approaches to that very first breath. And the differences keep coming. After you've got the lungs open, the ERC is incredibly specific. Give exactly 30 breaths per minute. Precision is key. 
The AHA, on the other hand, gives the clinician a wider lane to drive in, recommending a range of 30 to 60 breaths. It's really a classic tale of precision versus clinical flexibility. The same pattern plays out when it comes to oxygen. The ERC's approach is clean and simple. You basically got two settings. Bigger babies get room air at 21% oxygen, and smaller, preterm babies get a little boost to 30%. Easy to remember. The AHA has a more granular, three-tiered system. And for the most premature babies, get this. They give the green light to go all the way up to 100% oxygen if needed. That is a huge difference from the ERC starting point. So we've seen all these different philosophies and techniques, but then when the situation gets truly critical, when we move into advanced life support, something fascinating happens. The debate stops. The two manuals snap together, and suddenly they are singing from the exact same hymn sheet. Check this out. When it comes to the life or death procedure of chest compressions, the rule books are a mirror image. The trigger to start, identical. The technique to use, identical. The three to one ratio, identical. The depth, identical. This isn't just a suggestion. This is the undisputed global standard of care, full stop. And that powerful alignment continues right on through to medications and getting IV access. The dose for IV epinephrine is identical. The primary route for giving that medicine, the umbilical vein, is the same. It's amazing. In the most critical moments, there is just rock solid consensus. Okay, we've been deep in the weeds for a bit, so let's pull back up to 30,000 feet and summarize the key differences you absolutely need to take away from this. So if you remember nothing else, remember these four splits. First, starting the breaths. The ERC's five long, slow breaths versus the AHA's standard ones. Second, the breathing rate. The ERC's precise 30 versus the AHA's flexible range. Third, oxygen. The ERC's simple two-tier system versus the AHA's more complex granular model. And finally, that philosophical divide on cord milking. Is it a reasonable option or an absolute last resort? Now, it is so important to understand why these differences exist. This is not about one group being right and the other wrong. As the source document itself says, it's about two groups of world-class experts looking at the exact same scientific evidence and interpreting it through their own slightly different philosophical lenses. It's a fascinating peek behind the curtain of how science becomes clinical practice. And all of this leaves us with one final big question to chew on. When it comes to a baby's first breath, what's really the better path forward? a single unified global standard that everyone on the planet follows to the letter? Or is there real value in having these slightly different tailored approaches that reflect different philosophies? Ultimately, what's best for the world's newest and most vulnerable patients? It's something we're thinking about.